Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum, which is a greeting of peace, peace be unto you. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of The Dean Show. Today we're going to be talking about the verbatim word of God, which is the Quran. Now, you are intelligent enough to know that there is only one God. Everything in this universe is running according to His will. The sun, the moon, all the galaxies, everything out there, you don't see other gods besides the one God, because if you did, there'd be confusion in the universe. There'd be chaos, but you do not see this. That's why this is a testimony in itself that there's only one God. Now, this one God who loves us, He cares for us, He provides the air that we breathe, gives us the food that we eat, and He wants to guide us. So throughout time, He has sent messengers to tell us how He wants us to live. Now, these messengers... They were the way, just like during the time of Moses, he was the way, teaching you the truth on how to get to God. And he was equipped with certain signs, wonders, and miracles to prove, to establish that he was indeed a messenger from the one God. Then we had Jesus, who was the way, who was the truth, who was the light in a time when people were in darknesses. He was the light showing you, teaching you how to get to the one God. Abraham, Noah, and the last and final messenger, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, they were all teachers instructing all the human beings on how to worship the one God, how to get close to Him, and how to attain paradise. Now, they were given certain proofs and evidences. And today, we're going to be talking about the evidence that is a living miracle to this day. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he did certain miracles during his time. But we have today the living miracle, which is, as I said earlier, the verbatim word of God, which is a sign for anybody who is honest and sincere with himself. If he comes at it with an open heart and open mind, ask God to guide him, he will see that this is not from a human being, that this is indeed from the Creator. So my next guest when I come out is going to be establishing some evidences to help those who are sincere with themselves and with their Creator to know, like we know, over 1.5 billion people all around the world, that this is indeed from the Creator of the heavens and earth and instructional for you. Thank you. We'll be right back. You don't want to go nowhere. Be Allah. There's only one God and Muhammad is his messenger Allah, la ilaha illallah Allah, there's only one God and Jesus was his messenger Allah, la ilaha illallah I don't know why I did that, maybe it's just, maybe it's just to break the ice Dr. Sabil, the Dr. Dawa, Assalamu Alaikum Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We've partnered up in the past. You've been on the Dean Show. You're no stranger to our viewers. Good to be here. And greetings to all the viewers. Peace and blessings to all of you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. We're going to be talking about something that's very, very exciting for us to talk about is the Quran. It's nothing complicated to figure out, but you're going to help establish some of those evidences. You're going to help us tackle this topic so the sincere person out there can come to the realization as we have that this book which was revealed over a span of 23 years is indeed revelation from the creator of the heavens and earth talk to us about this Quran all right bismillah rahman rahim in the name of Allah the most beneficent the most merciful as we all know that uh, we as human beings we are created by a, a, a being who is higher than us who we Muslims refer to as Allah and we know that this creator is a loving creator who would like to guide us. So all throughout history, he has sent prophets and messengers. It says in chapter 16 of the Quran, verse number 36, that it is Allah who has sent messengers to all the nations. And they came with one truth. Worship God alone. Do not worship his creation. Yes. Now to certain messengers and prophets, our creator, he has given certain books, certain revelations. One of those revelations or the last revelation is the Qur'an which was given to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, about 1400 years ago. 
Now, in the Quran, Allah has mentioned many, many times that human beings, we should use our logic, we should use our mind, we should ponder, we should think, we should reflect. So Islam is not a faith of just blindly believing just because of our culture, parents, society, friends is telling us to believe in. Mm -hmm. Islam wants us to use our mind and establish the evidence. So since we Muslims huh? say that... Hold, hold on, there's something going off here. You said some Arabic words, you're going to have to <laughs> define them. Now you said Islam and Muslims, mm -hmm. talk to us. What's Islam, what's Muslim? You know, they, they don't understand some people. All right, um, the word Allah. Allah is the name of the one true God, the universal God. It's the God of the whole creation. Human beings, animals, the universe, sun, moon, everyone. Mm -hmm. In the Arabic language, we call him the name Allah. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. In, Arab, uh, in the Aramaic language, he also used to call God as Allah. Ah. Right? Very important. The word Islam means that you're submitting yourself to the one unseen creator. Submission to the Creator is Allah. It's starting to make sense now. And the person who submits is a Muslim. Mm. All right. Now so those are the three important terms uh, for the benefit the, of the viewers. The, these here. concepts now they're going down easy to di digest. Go ahead, continue, please. All right. So since um, since we have a book which claims that it is from the Creator. Muslims, since we are given a brain, all humani humanities, we, you know, we are given brains to think and ponder. So we just cannot blindly accept just because our parents are telling us that this book is from our creator. Mm -hmm. So we have to establish some evidence for our own sake and for the sake of the viewers and the non-Muslims who may not yet believe that Quran is from Allah. So in this show, inshallah, God willing, we are going to provide some evidence, some very concrete evidence, historical and prophecies and uh, scientific and, um, you know, geological and all of those evidences to prove that, yes, this book cannot be from any other author except of the creator himself. So you're telling us that you're going to give some historical evidences, scientific, some prophecies th that they're all in this book. You're going to give Indeed. it to us today, inshallah. Indeed, inshallah. Okay, I'm sure they're excited to hear. But before we go on, we raised up a book now. And some people are probably wondering, a book? Did God just drop this book from the sky? Did he just give it? How did it come to be a book? How do we just briefly, because this is a topic in and of itself, but just so we get this out of people's minds that they don't, from the start, have some confusion. What do we mean when we're holding them a book? Did it come like this? Explain this for us. Okay, Revelation came to different prophets. Okay. Now, those revelations were written down by human beings. So, when the revelation of the Qur'an came uh, by our Creator, He did not drop a book in the lap of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It came in the mind of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the revelation. And he invited his companions who knew how to read and write to compose a book that we see right now, which is the Qur'an. But in the presentation, inshallah, today, we are going to go much more deeper into the very topic that you have mentioned. How did we have this book in the form of, you know, uh, between the two covers? Okay, so talk to us now. Let, let's go for the evidence number one that you want to establish. What is the first piece of evidence that you can give us to keep people tuned into this show now? Something that's going to want them to want more. Talk to us. Sure. So the number one uh, claim that the Muslims do... Uh, do provide as an evidence is that the Quran itself says, says many, many places. One of those places is in chapter 32, verse number 2 of the Quran. It says that the verses, the revelation of this book is from the Lord of the Alameen, the Lord of the universe. So inside, the, the, the creator is identifying that he's revealed it. Yes, so that's very important. That is a important point. That's a yeah. very important point, right? So it says that the, the author of this book is Allah himself, the creator himself. But the non-Muslim viewers may be obviously saying, okay, fine, I could write a book and I could say that this book is from God. It does not make it from God, right? So now we have to provide additional evidence. In the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, Arabic language was at its eloquence, in its peak. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, you know, just like English language way back in the 15th, 16th century when Shakespeare was alive, yeah. it was the, the standards was very high compared to, you know, some of the language that we're speaking now. Mm -hmm. So in the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, 
They used to be people who used to be of such a high caliber in Arabic language that they used to be called as the Shakespeare's of their, or their times. Mm -hmm. In English language, we have one Shakespeare. In Arabic language, in the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, they used to be literally, you know, uh, tens and uh, you know, hundreds of Shakespeare's just walking around. In each single corner, you could meet, meet one Shakespeare. Yeah. The, the reason I'm bringing this topic is that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when he started to utter the verses of the Qur'an, that this is coming from, um, from the Creator himself, right? Some people, they begin to doubt. Yeah. They begin to doubt, saying that how can this person who did not know how to read and write, who just grew up, you know, uh, in front of us, how come this person is bringing a book and claiming that this book is from God? So to those people who are doubting the Qur'an itself, it makes some challenges. Mm, challenge. It's very important that our Creator is challenging the people who are doubting that this book is from God. So there are m multiple challenges which came. Mm -hmm. And these challenges are not coming to just any lay person out there on the ground, right? Mm -hmm. They are coming to the people who are masters of their language. Yes. Okay. So, in chapter 17 of the Qur'an, right? Chapter 17, verse number 88 of the Qur'an, the creator of the universe is mentioning in the Qur'an that if all of humanity and the jinns, jinns is a different creation by the way, if all of humanity and the jinns were gathered together to produce the likeness of the Qur'an, they would never be able to do it. Mm -hmm. So this challenge came to, uh, to make the non-believers ponder that if you think that this book is coming from a human being, why don't you go and sit down and equal, compose something which is similar or better than this book. Try to collaborate everybody, yes. all your Shakespeare's and all the people from, you know, your heads, the, the most intelligent among you, try, even with the unseen jinn, like the, would you say the spirits yes. come together and you can't do it? Right, so that was the very first challenge, That's a deep right? challenge, yeah. yeah. So that's a deep challenge that came to the unbelievers of that time. And guess what? There is not a single evidence that they came together, you know, having like a round conference, round table conference to compose a book. Mm -hmm. So Allah, God, you know, just to, uh, just to make them ponder, He reduced the challenge. The Quran has 114 chapters in there. They're called as the surahs, chapters, okay? So the initial challenge was to compose a book, 114 chapters. Now, since they were not able to do it, Allah, just to mock them, just to make them realize, He reduced the challenge. Okay, He reduced the challenge. It says in the chap chapter 10 of the Qur'an, that if you're not able to produce the whole Qur'an, produce only 10 chapters, 10 surahs, as eloquent, full of knowledge, full of wisdom, full of prophecies, scientific facts, as the Qur'anic chapters. And guess what? They did not came together, because they knew that they're not able to accomplish the job. Now, we do believe, and I want to just tell me if this is one example of that, where if the creator of the heavens and earth is saying, bring something like it. So for those who are saying that this might have come, this could have come, he got it from uh, other revelations, from the Bible, from the Jews and the Christians, all they have to do was show that, okay, look, it's the same thing, like he plagiarized from someone else, which if we give a living example, if you do look into certain places in the Bible, you will see identical, word for word, some uh, pages that are identical to other pages in the Bible, like mm -hmm. where Matthew or uh, who was it would copy from Luke and Matthew copied they're from supposedly copied from Mark. Identical, gospel. word for word. Many different passages. So, correct. would this be something of the challenge that you can uh, we're talking about? Well, the challenge was to compose in Arabic language, not in English or Greek or any language. In Arabic language, compose yeah. any composition which is better in eloquence, in full of wisdom, uh, you know, taking people away from uh, falsehood, mm -hmm. bringing them to, you know, all the good things that they're supposed to be doing. Yeah. So they're supposed to do that, right? That's the challenge. But guess what? They're not able to accomplish that. So then God reduced the challenge. In, it says in chapter 10 of the Quran, uh, chapter 11, verse number 13 of the Qur'an, mm -hmm. compose 10 verses, I mean 10 chapters, like the Qur'an's chapter. They did not do it, right? Then the challenge was reduced. Chapter 2 of the Qur'an, verse number 23 and 24, it says that if you're not able to compose the full Qur'an or 10 chapters, 
produce only one chapter. And they couldn't do it. They're not able to do it. But, the, you know, the, the, the magnitude of the challenge is very, you know, mind-boggling. The Quran has 114 chapters. It's a big book, by the way. Yeah. It's a big book. 114 chapters. Some chapters are very big. It has 286 verses in chapter number two. And other chapters are small. Mm -hmm. Has only three verses. So the challenge was not to compose a chapter as big as the biggest of the chapter. It could be the smallest of the chapter which has only three verses in there. Right? So it's a mind-boggling challenge for all of humanity and not just humanity, all of jinns to compose three simple sentences as the Quranic sentences, similar to the Quranic sentences. That's all they had to do. If they could have done that, Islam would have been abolished, dismantled, disappeared mm -hmm. way back, 1400 yeah. years ago. But since we have Islam now, it proves that they've been not able to do it. So there is no historical evidence from both Islamic or non-Islamic sources that they got together. Okay, very important. Number two, some people may say that um, this is a subjective challenge, mm -hmm. right? That, okay, fine. If I cook a dish and if you cook a dish and if you ask someone to come and taste the dish, right? They may like my cooking, your cooking, somebody else is cooking. cooking. So it could be subjective, right? Yeah, so depends they are arbitrary the, that, you know. Depends on the person's taste. Yeah. I may like a poetry better than a second poetry and uh -huh. you may have a different taste. But the Quranic challenge is not subjective. Yes. That's very important for the viewers for, to, for them to realize. In Arabic language, there are three different modes in which a, a, someone could compose anything. Mm -hmm. First, you have the poetry. That's called the Bihar. Yes. And poetry is divided in Arabic language into 16 categories. Okay? Mm -hmm. Then you have the Mursal. Mursal is like the common speech, mm -hmm. like what we are saying, you know, speaking right now. Yeah. Okay? Then you have the Saj. Saj means it's a combination of poetry and prose, but it's not a clear cut into any one of these categories. Okay? So the challenge of the Quran is that to compose something which is similar or exceeding the Quran. Okay? The reason that the non-believers, they were, you know, are not able to come together and compose something like the Quran is, they realize that anything that they are going to compose, it is going to fall into one of these three categories. Mm -hmm. The poetry, the poetry, yes. the prose, or the combination of poetry and the prose. But guess what? Quran, this is a miracle of the Quran, by the way. Quran does not fit into those three categories. Not at all, huh? No. So, an example would be, suppose, if we call all the engineers, the best architects, the best builders in the world, and uh, and ask them to build the best uh, skyscraper, the best building, the most you know, beautiful, eloquent building. Anything that they're going to build would be how many dimensions? Three. Mm -hmm. It has to be three dimension, right? Yeah. The most eloquent uh, you know, uh, structure. Suppose if someone composes or builds a sculpture or building which is four dimensions, ah, right? Yeah. Someone, suppose if I bring a four-dimension structure, no human being would be able to, uh, you know, uh, replicate it. Mm -hmm. Likewise, when the Arabs of their time, who are the most eloquent in their language, when they saw the Quran, they knew that it's, it does not fall into these three categories. So Quran, by its nature, it's a fourth, fifth, tenth dimensional structure. Mm -hmm. So that is what made them, you know, not able to even come together to compose the likeness of the Qur'an. So we have the language and the challenge. We, those are two very strong points. Let's move on to something else. Give us some more evidence for the person now who's really, you got his attention. Okay, very good. Yeah. So instead of the non-Muslims, right, who did not believe in the Prophet or Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, or the oneness of the Creator, and they used to worship the pagan gods and sun and the moon and the creation, mm -hmm. all they had to do was come together, right, to compose three sentences. But guess yeah. what? Since they were not able to do that, what did they start to do? They started to come and physically torture the Muslims, right? Mm -hmm. And beyond that, they fought 27 battles with Muslims. 
and in those battles not only the, not only the, the muslims they suffered even the non muslims mm -hmm. they suffered by their property by their family by their country and by their lives all the bloodshed all the battles could have been avoided by by them composing three simple sentences yes. is it mind boggling yeah. right absolutely yeah all right so that is the very first challenge and the evidence that the Quran cannot be from a human being, it has to be from the Creator. They didn't have to yeah. exhort themselves that much, just bring up these three lines, uh, beat the challenge and... Get it over with. Yeah. Islam would be dismantled, right? Yes. And that challenge still stands, by the way. There are 15 million Christians whose native language is Arabic, mm -hmm. living in the Arab lands. Yes. This challenge is even open for them. Mm -hmm. And right now, we have the computers and the modern technology they could bring all of those things together and they could get the help of the jinns if they want to. Yeah. All right. So let's move on to the next evidence for the truth of the Quran. Yeah, give us some more. Now, let's let's go down. We're almost out of time. So we got the challenge of the language and the uh, linguistic challenge. Now, let's go on to something else. All right. So there are many, many prophecies in the Quran. Prophecies. Okay? Prophecies in the Quran. One of those eloquent prophecies is in chapter 15, mm -hmm. verse number 9, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Inna nahnu nazzalna zikra wa inna lahu la hafizun. Which means, it is Allah who has sent down this message, this zikr, this Quran, and it is Allah who is going to protect it. Mm -hmm. Protection from any addition, any deletion, any revision, and it getting lost. So the Qur'an that we have today right now in our hands is exactly the same Qur'an uh, word for word that was given to Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him without any change, without any change. So the way that happened, you know, really quickly is that as soon as a verse used to be revealed to Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, right? He, by the miracle of Allah, he used to memorize it. Uh -huh. And in his lifetime, he memorized the whole book. It's not a small book, by the way. Look at how many pages, right? It's a big book. He memorized the whole Quran in his lifetime. Companions around him, tens and hundreds and thousands of them, they memorized the whole Quran. Mm -hmm. it, that's a second miracle. People of all generations, they kept on memorizing the Quran. They kept on memorizing the Quran up until the year 2009 yes. without any break, breakage in any generation. And guess what? There are 10, 10 million people living right now, Muslims, who have memorized the whole Quran. So this is, it's been memorized as it was memorized back then and it was passed down and we have it in its original, memorized like and recited like it was back then. Yes, continuous chain of memorization and there is no book, no Bible, Old Testament, New Testament, the Hindu Vedas, the Buddhist, any scripture or any secular scripture for that matter, who has, uh, which has been memorized by that many people for that long a time. Tell us now, we have a few more minutes and we have, there's so much to cover, this time mm -hmm. goes by fast. Science. This is the uh, time now where science is not like it was before. And tell us, is there any things of science mentioned in the Quran that wasn't known back then, but it's known today and it's mentioned in the Quran? Sure. Very good. Very good. See, the Quran has 6,000 plus verses in there, right? Mm -hmm. And not, close to 500 of those verses, they deal with modern scientific facts. Mm -hmm. Okay, not theories, not hypotheses, modern scientific facts. Mm -hmm. 500 of them, and guess what? None of them are contradicted by the modern scientific uh, you know, uh, discoveries and mm -hmm. inventions. So just imagine a human being, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, living in the seventh century, did not know how to read and write without any telescope or mi microscope or, or any instruments that we are familiar with, coming up with scientific truths, okay? So let's, um, you know, in maybe a couple of um, minutes, it says in the Quran, chapter 21, verse number 30, Don't the unbelievers see that the heavens and the earth, they were joined together, and yeah. it is Allah who has made them asunder. Mm -hmm. So that speaks about the fact about the, the Big Bang, the, parad the paradigm that we, all the scientists in the world, that's how they uh, believe that the universe came into existence. A primordial mass, eventually explosion, that explosion gave rise to all the galaxies, the sun and the moon and the whole world that we live in. Mentioned in this Quran. Mentioned in the Quran, discovered just in the last century mm -hmm. by using our Hubble telescope and the red shift and the blue shift and all of that. A person living in the, in the desert cannot have done that. 
it has about things about embryology embryology all right embryology means uh, when a fetus when a baby develops inside the mother's womb mm -hmm. it describes in details many many places in the quran that uh, from a very you know uh, few cell stage how is the baby looks like correct how the baby looks like and how it develops and all of those things and it's scientifically accurate in fact there are, there are many scientists living in our day and age dr keith moore uh, dr maurice bukai dr uh, marshall johnson who whose books that i have read in my medical science by the way yes. and they testify to the fact that a human being cannot have done those things it has to be coming from god maurice bukai says that Robert Marshall says that, and uh, you know Keith Moore says that. These are the specialists in those fields. These they are specialists, yeah. embryologists, and medical doctors, give, and physicians. Give us yes. one more point. We're all, we gotta go. One more point, and then we're gonna have to do a part two. Talk to us. One more thing that's just okay. Very good. Amazing. Chapter four of the Quran, verse number eighty-two. It says that had this book been from other besides uh, other than the Creator Allah, you would have found many contradiction in it. Right? Mm -hmm. So if you examine anyone, anyone, if you pick up the Quran and you read the Quran, you would not find any contradiction, neither internal nor external. No contradiction when it comes to Quran and science, Quran and philosophy, Quran and uh, you know, uh, the things that we are aware of, the things that we know of. Mm -hmm. So Quran is free of contradiction. A big book written by a person who is not able to read and write cannot have come with that many verses without contradicting himself. For someone who wants to look further, into the science aspect or some of these other miracles is there any reading that you recommend that they do any books in particular yeah there are many books uh, one book that i would recommend is the book by dr maurice bukai uh, the quran and the si the quran the bible and the quran in the light of history and science and the website that i would recommend is gain peace g a i n uh, peace p e a c e dot com okay oh. Okay, yes. we're gonna have to. We're gonna do a part two, okay. uh, inshallah, God willing, because we had so much to cover, so mm -hmm. little time. So we're gonna continue talking about the verbatim word of God. We're gonna cut out. Thank you for helping thank us, you much. and we're gonna be back with you in a few. And we'd like to thank you for coming to be with us this week on the Dean Show. Where we're talking about the verbatim word of God, establishing evidences that this is indeed from the creator of the heavens and earth. So much to cover, so little time. We're going to come back and we're going to cover part two on why this Quran can be from no one other than the creator of the heavens and earth. We're going to be right back. You don't go nowhere here on the Dean Show with our guest, Dr. Sabil. <laughs> Mohammed could not have known these facts about human development in the 7th century because most of them were not discovered until the 20th century. That God transmitted through Mohammed bits of his knowledge that we have only discovered for ourselves in recent times. 1,400 years ago, when the world was immersed in darkness, the Quran was revealed, which brought light to a beleaguered world. And whereas the earlier books came with many scientific mistakes due to the hand of man having delved into them, the Quran had none of these contradictions. The world thought there could be no reconciliation between religion and science. But the Quran mentioned many scientific facts in great detail, like how a human being developed in the mother's womb and described other scientific facts which amaze the world's renowned scientists and scientific community. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to the Dean Show. This week we're talking, we're sitting with the Dr. Dawa, which I call him my good friend, Dr. Sabil, and we're talking about the verbatim word of God, giving those people out there who are sincere, honest, and they want to know the truth, giving them some evidences that the Quran is indeed the verbatim word of God and nobody else. Let's bring Dr. Sabila and continue this topic. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa wa barakatuhu. We and are, peace, uh, peace and blessings to all the viewers up there. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. All right, we have so much evidence here and there are so many proofs. This is just something just to scratch the surface, just to get the people excited that they can go on their own and do some more investigating. So in part one, we established some evidences. 
And for each one of those, you can talk for hours. Now we're going to be in part two, we're going to be talking about the possibilities of the person who is naturally, we don't want them to just swallow anything blindly. We want them to use their mind, to, to use the tools that God Almighty has given them, to judge, to be sincere, to see like, could this be from a man? Or can this be from, you know, someone in something in the creation that put this together? Or is this indeed from the creator? So some people have come up with some arguments sure. that possibly that he copied it from previous scriptures like the Bible. What do you have to say about this? All right. Uh, yes. We have the Quran up here who we Muslims, there are 1.5 billion Muslims in the world. And we all claim that this is the book, the author of this book was no other than the creator himself. We all say that, we Muslims, right? Now, in the part one of the show, we have provided some evidence, right? Mm -hmm. That it cannot be a human being, it has to be from God. Okay. Now, in today's show, part number two, we are going to examine some of the possible authorships that some non-Muslims, that they claim that this book is fine. Since they don't believe that this is from God, they claim that this book is either from copied from the Bible or Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he authored the Quran, you know, from his own thoughts and contemplating and all of that. Some people say that this book was copied from the Greeks and the Roman literature. And some say that, you know, in a nausbillah, God forbid this book is coming from Satan. These are some of the arguments that yeah. you hear from people. Indeed. Okay, so we want to knock all these out to make sure we clear all this junk that's in the way. All right, so that people can see the truth for what it is. All right, so uh, let's take the number one possible uh, authorship of the Quran. And many people, especially the Jews and the Christians, they claim that the book has been copied from mm -hmm. the Bible. Yeah. Now, before we dwell on that, it's very important for us to realize that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, it says in chapter 7 of the Quran, verse number 157 and 158, that he is a, was a prophet, a person who did not knew how to read and write. You know, we all had formal education. We could read our names. We could read books. We could read, you know, internet and stuff. Yeah. But Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, even if you showed his name on the paper, he's not able to read his name, right? Mm -hmm. So, number one, he is, was an illiterate prophet, did not have any education. Number two, suppose if you take up the theory of was the Quran copied from the Bible. Now, in the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, the Old, the Old Testament or the New Testament in its complete form in Arabic language was not available. Mm -hmm. Very important. Okay, the language of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him was, uh, I mean, Arabic, right? Yes. But the Old Testament is in Hebrew. The mm -hmm. New Testament in Greek. Yes. Right. So for Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, even if he had access to the Greek and the Hebrew Bible, how would he able to read it? So the very first translation or the complete translation of uh, the Old Testament was done in the 10th century, okay? So um, he didn't have access to... He did not have access, okay? okay by a, by a scholar point. named Sadia Gaon, he uh -huh. is the one who made the translation around the 10th century uh -huh. CE, okay? Number two, uh, the translation of all of the New Testament was done in the year 1616, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, in the year 1671, Rome, it did the complete translation of all the 66 books of the Bible in Arabic language. That is like close to 1,000 years after Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was gone. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, just because there are similarities in the Bible and in the Quran does not mean that one book copied from the other book. It is possible that they both have common source, right? They both have common source. So what we Muslims believe is that, yes, Revelations came to previous prophets, Prophet Jesus, uh -huh. Prophet Moses, Prophet David, and other prophets, peace be upon them. And some of the remnants of those revelations are still present in the Old and the New Testament. Uh -huh. And when the Creator, when He sent the Quran, He also mentions some of the stories of the previous prophets. Okay, So just because there are similarities does not mean Quran plagiarized from the Bible no, they all have a common source. So when it comes to the Bible, we see that there are many similarities. And I'm just going to touch upon two similarities because of the shortness of time. And then we will judge. I will have our dear viewers to judge yourself to see if the Quran was copied from the Bible. Number one, <clears throat> there are similarities in the story 
when it comes to the story of Noah, Noah mm. alayhi salam, right? Yes. Prophet Noah, peace be upon him, the prophet of the ark, all right? So in Genesis, in the book of Genesis, in the Old Testament, the very first book, chapter 7, verse number 11, it mentions that because, you know, people were very evil in his time, uh, the time of Prophet Noah, God as a punishment, he sent rain for 40 days and 40 nights and the whole world was submerged in water. Yeah. Right? And all of humanity, anything that breathes in the whole world was destroyed. Mm -hmm. Except the people and the beings, the living beings who were there in the ark. Yes. Right? So according to the Bible, the whole world was destroyed. Now, Quran also mentions a similar story. Okay? Mm -hmm. Chapter number 11, verse number 21 of the Quran, it also mentions a similar story. However, the Quran says that it was the people of Noah who were disbelievers, who were rejecting God, who were doing evil, they were the ones who were destroyed. Mm. The Quran says it was a local flood, local, not a universal not flood. Not universal. Yeah. And is this something established now historically? Historically, it's established, archaeologists, yes. historians, they all have consensus that it was a local flood. In fact, there is a very famous book called The History, The Bible as History, yeah. okay? by Weber, Keller Weber, he is the author of it. And this is what he has to say, that archaeology has not yet established a flood to the magnitude of the flood mentioned in the Bible, but it has established that there was a flood in the northwest region of Persian Gulf in 400 miles times 100 miles. That is the area in which Prophet Noah and his uh, people were living. Amazing. So this is one example. I'm sure there, uh, I'm confident that there are many more that you can give, but we have so little time. Talk about the next point that he himself, he is the one behind, he's the mastermind behind this Quran. All right, so some people, okay, so we have established uh, the fact that the Quran cannot have been copied from the Bible uh, or else the Quran would have incorporated those same, you know, quote-unquote mistakes, mistakes that yeah. are present in the Bible. Mm -hmm. But how come the Quran left off those mistakes and only extracted the authentic things, right? Yeah. Unless it has to be coming from the Creator. Indeed. Indeed, right? So now, some people claim that it was Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who was the author of the Qur'an. And now it's very important. First of all, he was a person who was, did not know how to read and write. On the top of it, he was given the title of a siddiq and al-Amin, the most honored and the most truthful person, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Not just by the Muslims, but also by the non-Muslims. Mm -hmm. So the most honest, the best role model person in that community is claiming that this book is from God. Why would he be lying? A person lies, a false prophet, he or she lies because of some ulterior gains for name and fame and money and you know power and all of those things. Did he, did he have a hidden bank account? Did he have, is it recorded that he had all, you know, lived a lavish lifestyle, that he had these worldly things that might have uh, to support these accusations? Well, actually, you know, uh, non-Muslims, since they did not like the message of the oneness of God, yeah. right? They wanted to worship all of those idols. They offered him, they bribed him actually, mm -hmm. that if you give up preaching the oneness of God, we'll give you the best, the most wealth, we'll make you the richest of the person. Yeah. If you desire that, we'll give you that. Or if you want, if you're seeking after power, we'll make you the head of the state of all of the uh, Arab region. Yeah. Or we'll give you the best women, the best girls for you to marry. Yeah. But guess what? A false prophet would have taken up the offer, right? Become the head of the state and whatever. But Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, since he was a true prophet, he rejected that offer. And he said, I'm not going to take that offer, even if they bring the sun and the moon in my right and my left hand. So the life that he le led, you know, Brother Eddie, was a life of very modest, very humble life. His house was smaller than the studio. Mm -hmm. You know, he had only like maybe just a one or two items in his house. And there are narrations that, by his wives that sometimes there was nothing for them to eat for three days and three nights. All they had to do eat was, you know, just some dates and some water. So the Prophet, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was much more richer, okay, before he claimed prophethood than after he claimed prophethood. 
Yeah. What could have been the motive for that? Yeah, it's amazing. Is there anything in the Quran now, if someone is saying that, look, he's the mastermind behind this, obviously someone's going to want to elevate himself. Someone's going to want to put themselves in the spotlight. Is there anything in this verbatim word of God now that would support this? Is there the calamity that struck him in his own personal life with his wife mm -hmm. dying or any of these other personal sure. uh, situations? Are they mentioned in there? Well, that's a very important point, by the way. See, the Quran has 6,000 plus verses. It yeah. speaks about, you know, many individuals, many prophets and all of that. It speaks about some of uh, the common people. Mm -hmm. Many tra tragedies struck Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, right? His wife, the most beloved wife, Khatija. Yeah. Allah's peace be upon her. She passed away, right? Is that not a mention, in there? not a mention about that. But what is mentioned is about the mother of me, uh, uh, Jesus, peace be upon her. Mm. Okay? So, if Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, if he used to love his wife and his daughters and his children so much, and he had so many tragedies in his life, how come none of those things are mentioned in there? It's not mentioned in there, huh? Yeah, if he were, you know, God forbid, a false prophet, he would have mentioned and elevated and honored and praised his family. He did not do it. He didn't do he it. He didn't do it. And he did not praise himself. So much to cover, so little time. The next possibility that some skeptics might bring up is that he got this from his visiting with others in different tribes, other Jews and Christians, people from uh, from the Greeks, from other methodologies. What do we got to say about this? All right. Uh, there were some Jews and some Christians, okay? Not that many, by the way. Some scattered yeah. around uh, the Middle Eastern region, okay? The three important ones that he had interaction with were Waracha, okay? Waracha was the uncle of the first wife of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Her name was Khatija. Yeah. Okay, peace be upon her. Now, he was a Christian. Waracha was a Christian. So when the initial revelation came, the Prophet, peace be upon him, he went to Waracha uh, and he, you know, had some interaction with him. Waracha confirmed that you are a prophet and that, you, that your people are going to reject you just the way that they have rejected other people, right? Now, now this uh, waraka that you're saying for right. the, some people who are uh, hearing this name for the first time, can you kind of give more of a, who was this person? Yeah, this person you, used to be a pagan. He converted to Christianity, okay. right? So he knew who prophet, uh, what is prophethood. He knew what revelation is and he knew the prophecies. He knew the criteria to match to be a prophet. Yeah, not only that, he knew the prophecies mentioned in the Old and the New Testament about the coming of a prophet. Okay. Yeah, that could be a different show, but yeah. there are prophecies in the New and the Old Testament about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Mm -hmm. So, after a few days after Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was appointed as a prophet, Waraha, he passed away. Yeah. So the bottom line is Waraha was not alive when the bulk of the Quran was revealed and written down. So how can he have been an author of the Quran? How about Greek uh, writings or these other ancient... Sure. So some people do bring up the notion that uh, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he extracted the material, especially the scientific facts, which are mentioned in the Quran, right? Yeah. The Quran has 6,000 plus verses in there and no less than 500 of them that deal with modern scientific facts which has been confirmed by our scientists to be as true. Yeah, amazing. Right. Now, there are some scientific truths in the Greek, Roman, Persian, Chinese, Indian, Egyptian writings. Uh -huh. There's no doubt about it. Yeah. Okay, that's a fact that they do contain some scientific truths. Besides the scientific truths, they also contain an incorrect scientific statements. Mm -hmm. So now, okay, before I make that statement, suppose if not, I'm not a good student, right? And if I have to take a final exam, and if I'm sitting next to a person who is a B average student, mm -hmm. if I'm going to plagiarize all of his uh, uh, answers, right? Uh, at the end of uh, the time, at the end of the exam, am I going to get an A grade? Suppose if this guy is getting a B grade, would I get an A grade if I copied 100% from that person? No, not at all. Not at all, right? Because along with the right answers that he's, uh, you know, writing, I'm also going to incorporate the incorrect answers, correct? Mm -hmm. In the same way, even if for the sake of argument that if Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had a laptop computer with all the knowledge of the ancient world and that he knew how to read and write, okay, for the sake of argument, 
Even then, if he had to extract the material, how did he only extract it, the truths from those scriptures and left the falsehoods, right? Unless he was a prophet of Allah. Yeah. Unless he was a prophet, right? Because in those ancient scriptures, right? They say that the Quran, uh, not the Quran, the world, some of them used to say that the world was flat. Some said that the world was flat floating on the ocean. Yeah. Some say that the world was, uh, you know, round and spherical. So out of many, many different notions that they had, truth and falsehood, how come the Quran says in chapter number 71, verse number 3, that the, that the world is spherical, like an egg shape, not the shape of a hen egg, but the shape of an ostrich egg. And that's how the, the, the shape of the world is. Do we have any reports that, because obviously if you're sitting with people and say you take their work, now that these people start to see that you are, uh, uh, people are starting to admire your teachings and you're getting some, some publicity and you're getting some attention, they're going to come out and say, hey, 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 hold on, I taught you that. Mm -hmm. Do we have people raising their hands and saying like, no, no, he got it from me. D do we have any accounts of this? In the life of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him, there was not a single person, not a single person, unbeliever, who raised his hand and said, you know what you're saying in the Quran, I already knew it. I taught you that. I taught you that, or I knew it. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, found in this scripture. Mm -hmm. None, no one raised their hand and accused the Prophet. If they would have done it, Islam would have been dismantled. So this is our, these are really just silly arguments, but obviously, you know, they're worth touching upon because for the sincere person, he kind of sees through this, and, he's, and, and this just confirms with him to continue uh, uh, looking into this because indeed, I mean, it's overwhelming the amount of evidence that proves that this is indeed from the Creator. There's one more uh, point. Some people say that this is from the devil. This is from, and we in Arabic we say shaitan. Yeah. What, what do you got to say about this? All right. Uh, yeah, that says uh, even though you know for Muslims that sounds like a very um, you know crazy argument. Okay. But for according to you know you know some Christians and whatever, they do make that accusation. By the way, but this is deep. I mean, if you think yeah. about this, because you're you're already acknowledging that this is something superhuman. This is not it can't come from a human being. So right. you know, yeah. So people okay, people they want to deny that the Quran is from God. So they are just going to one source or the other source. And Muslims we keep on destroying all of those sources. Okay, now. The source that they do say is that the Quran, you know, God forbid, is from Satan. Yeah. Satan was the author of the Quran. Mm -hmm. And guess what? Satan is mentioned in the Quran, by the way. Yeah. Each time Shaitan or Satan is mentioned, he's mentioned in a negative term. Yeah. Very important. Negative term. Each time it mentioned, it says, don't believe in Satan. He's not God. Believe in God who is the creator of the heavens and the earth. Okay, mm -hmm. and it says on the top of it, any time that you're going to recite the Quran, "Audu billahi min shaitan rajim." That means, I seek refuge in Allah from the accursed Satan. All right, so Satan is being, uh, you know, rebuked in the Quran. He is being called as an enemy of humanity, yeah. and he's being, you know, uh, labeled in very, very negative way terms. Any time that he's been mentioned. So why would Satan would uh, you know, uh, make people go towards God and away from himself? Doesn't make sense. That's against the, the, the way Satan acts. So for Satan to be the mastermind now, this is again a silly argument that if you look at it, you, this is dismantled quickly because we as Muslims, ones who submit to the will of God, are seeking refuge with the Creator from the Satan. Right, and Satan was a jinn. Okay, yeah. jinns are created beings. Mm -hmm. And with that, Satan is not all-knowing. He doesn't yeah. know the past, he doesn't know the future. But Quran has historical things of the past and prophecies of the future. So even if Satan, for the sake of argument, was the author, he would not have been able to come up with the historical facts and the prophecies of the future. And in, in, in the verbatim word of God, the Quran, God Almighty is admonishing things that the human being to stay away from satanic things, uh, yes. adultery, uh, fornication, uh, gambling, uh, uh, all, all the evil vices mm -hmm. that would obviously be more in line with teachings of what Satan or the devil wants you to do. He wants you to break up ties of kinship. It's, that's a major sin to break off ties of kinship. Uh, he wants you to go and cheat on your wife. That's a major sin in Islam. He wants you to set up gods besides the one God. That's, Something that will put you in a hellfire forever, but it doesn't just doesn't fit. It's yeah, I mean, unfathomable. That, that, yeah, that's for people to ponder, right? I mean, 
humanity, we are going through so many problems, right? And Satan would be calling humanity towards indulging in sin and evil. Yeah. Quran says that do not take alcohol or intoxicants. And intoxicants is one of, it says that it is a, uh, is a handiwork of Satan. Yeah. All right. So Islam is telling us to stay away from things which are bad for your, your person and bad for the society. And calling to all things which are good, right? Obligation to your parents, to your family, to humanity at large, to the neighbors and to the needy. And ultimately to submit to one God. That is the main message of the Qur'an, to submit to the one creator and not to his creation. May that be an idol, a human being, a saint, the sun or the moon. And Satan would be calling towards these things. So how come Satan, if he were the author, he would be calling people to the creation but not to the creator? But the Qur'an does the opposite. So with that, the, uh, Satan cannot be the author of the Qur'an. So wh where else do you go now? Okay, we, we, <laughs> we've, we've uh, refuted <clears throat> some of the arguments that someone who is possibly just wanting to know the truth, he said, how do I know that it didn't come from Muhammad? How do I know that he didn't take it from Muhammad? How do I know? You just gave some, some good proofs that no, this could not have been from anyone other than the Creator. So where does a person go from here now? Well, the only option that is left is that this Qur'an that we are, that we have in our hands, right? It cannot be from a human being. It cannot be from Satan. It cannot be extracted from the Bible. It cannot be uh, from Satan or jinn or any source. So the only possibility which is left right now is that this Quran is from a superhuman, super uh, about the creation source. And that source is the creator himself, who we Muslims call as Allah. Now, if that is the case, it becomes an obligation for each single human being to find out what the Qur'an is, what is the message of the Qur'an, how can it help me, and ultimately what, uh, how it's going to help me in the hereafter. How, how could someone get a copy of the verbatim Word of God? It's very easy, right? Um, we would like to give you a gift of the Qur'an, alright? And uh, this Qur'an is in, it has both Arabic and English in there. But some of you may not be able to read Arabic. So what we have done is we have translated the Qur'an into um, 100 plus languages. So if any one of you would like to obtain a free copy of the Qur'an in either Spanish or English language, they could contact a telephone number which is 800-662-ISLAM. 800-662-ISLAM. If you call the telephone number, we'll be able to send you a package that has a translation of the Qur'an in there and it has many, many other goodies in there for their benefit, inshallah. Inshallah. So tell us any advice for that person who now he, he has grown up in a different faith in Christianity, Hinduism, in Zoroastrianism, in this ism, that ism. And now, you know, he sees that by watching this that the evidence is overwhelming, that this, you know, this has to be from God. I mean, what, what can he do to break through them barriers, you know, the, 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 um, the timid, timidness of now possibly, you know, maybe losing some friends, maybe, you know, uh, being uh, associated with, you know, uh, some of the bad things that now the press and the media are associating with Islam. What advice do you give to that person who's just, you know, needs that little extra encouragement? Sure. That's a very relevant question and all human beings should ponder on that question, okay? We all know that me, you, each single one of us, we are going to pass away one day. And this life of 60, 70, 100 years is not the only life that we have to live. After we pass away, there would be a day of resurrection. Mm -hmm. Our Creator is going to resurrect us back to life, both in body and in our uh, soul. Yeah. And on, on that day, God is going to uh, evaluate us. There would be a day of judgment. And He's going to ask very two important questions. Did you believe in me alone? Or did you believe in a human being or an idol or sun, moon or the creation? And did you follow the guidance? And that guidance, Brother Eddie, and to all my viewers up there, is found in the Qur'an. In the Qur'an and in the life of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who was the last messenger and the last prophet sent to guide humanity. He was the mercy to mankind. So Islam, as we have mentioned in the initial part of the show, that means submission to the one creator. Mm -hmm. And all the prophets of God, may that be Adam or Noah or Moses and Jesus and Ishmael and Isaac and Muhammad, peace be upon them. If you examine the life of all of them, they did not used to worship a human being or an image or an idol, sun or the moon. They all used to submit 
to the one and same creator. That means by definition they were following the ideology of Islam, submission to the creator. And since they are submitting, they were all Muslims. So in that sense, Islam is not a new faith, it is the same faith that was brought by all the prophets. So if a person would like to embrace Islam, they are not embracing a new faith or a strange faith. They are embracing the same faith of all the prophets of God. Okay? That's very important. Mm -hmm. Now, we know that many revelations came before the Quran, but unfortunately those revelations are not preserved for us. May that be the Old Testament, New Testament, the Vedas and anything else of that matter, right? Who people claim to be as the word of God. Our life of eternity would be at stake depending upon what choice that we make in this world. Yes. So you have maybe like 10 different books on the table, correct? You have the Old Testament, New Testament and all the religious books of the world along with the Quran. Now we have provided our dear viewers enough evidence for any thinking human being is that how can the Quran which is over here cannot be, a, uh, uh, the author cannot be anyone besides Allah and it has not been changed. Any other book besides the Quran, it, it has been changed. Yes. Okay. So we cannot stake our life of eternity in something which is less than 100% compared to the Quran which is 100%, very important. So what can Islam offer for you, my dear viewers? Very important, right? There are so many problems which are going on in this world. Mm -hmm. We have a down economy, yeah. right? People, homicide is rampant. Mm -hmm. We are filling jail after jail. 2.3 million people who are in the jails, right? Mm -hmm. Despite that fact, and there are more police officers. Mm -hmm. Despite all of those facts, the crime is not decreasing, yeah. right? The rapes are not decreasing. 90,000 rapes in this, uh, in this country each year, right? Uh, assaults and guns and gangs and divorce and homicides and uh, uh, you know suicides solutions for all of them are found in Islam in the Quran in the final guidance that our creator has given to us it's all there, in the huh? Quran yes so not only Quran is calling us to worship one God and wants to make our life better in this world so we could stay away from the problems and the and the better part is it is calling us towards all the good things in this world Mm -hmm. Being, uh, you know, giving up cheating and, uh, you know, not lying, being honest, fulfilling your obligation to your wife and children and society at Everything large. Good. Making you a better person, society a better person. So it does away with all the problems, makes society peace, harmonious. Okay. But the best reward for a person who embraces Islam would be eternal paradise in the hereafter. Paradise. And we all wish ourselves our viewers, that we could all look into the Qur'an, ponder on the Qur'an, read the Qur'an, and ultimately embrace the truth, so we could all be together in paradise. We're running out of time, that's it. Thank you for helping us to cover this topic. Welcome. Inshallah, we'll have you back to cover another topic, and we'd like to thank you for tuning in to another episode of The Dean Show. You heard it, the evidence has been established, and it's very clear that this Quran could not have come from anyone else other than the creator of the heavens and the earth. At the end of the show, you see a number that you can call to get a free copy. And we hope that you are honest and sincere enough with yourself. Ask the one who created you to guide your heart to the truth. It's quite simple. You worship the one God. You worship Him alone. You submit to Him. And you do what He wants you to do on His terms. And that's it. And... We hope to have you back here again next time on The Dean Show. Until then, assalamu alaikum, peace be unto you.
It's cold, it's late, everybody sleeping. I arise and ask a lot of thinking me. Oh, Allah, you see. Oh, Allah, you know all the sins I do. I turn to you to forgive my sins and my heart. I'm your sinful slave. You're my loving Lord. I'm the one who runs away. Oh, Allah, guide me.